in the last two weeks, we've been looking at uh, different aspects of the self, how we're called to be selfless in our service and serving God and serving people, not to seek our own benefit, and how in the Lord, uh, when we belong to Jesus, it's no longer about us, it's about God. As uh, Galatians in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when the I is crucified, but the self is crucified, we can't be hankering after self-pity, self-esteem. We spoke about self-esteem on Thursday and on Tuesday and selflessness. And today I'm going to speak about confidence. Now in the world, normally uh, psychologists and people who counsel us, counsel human beings, they talk about having confidence in yourself, have self-confidence. But as believers in Christ, everything changes when we turn to Christ. It's no longer self-confidence, but confidence in Christ. Because he is the Lord of our lives. We are no longer Lord of our lives. He is Lord. That's why in 1 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Peter writes, Do not fear what they fear, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. He must have total lordship in our lives. So which means our confidence should be in him. Not in ourselves, but in him. When you're not in Christ, when you're without Christ, it's quite natural to seek after self-confidence, to believe in yourself. But after we turn to Christ, it's all about putting our entire trust in him. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul writes, Is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in himself or even other people. It's all about Christ. A typical example in the Bible read is about David. When David went before Goliath, when Goliath was telling the armies of Israel in the valley of Elah, every day came and challenged them. He said, send one of your men. We'll have a combat. Who wins? If I win, you serve me. If you win, uh, uh, we serve you. He kept on challenging the armies of Israel. No one could challenge him because he's a very powerful man, nine feet, nine inches tall, a giant. They're all scared of him. Till David came to the front lines, primarily to give food to his brothers who were there in the front lines. When he saw this giant challenging armies of Israel, he realized they're actually challenging God, the God of Israel. He was so upset by that. And he said, I will go and challenge this, this giant. When Saul called David and told, how are you going to, you're a small boy, how are you going to challenge this man? And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37, David says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. The Lord will deliver me. His confidence was not in himself, but in the Lord. And then he goes on to explain to Saul how, from verse 34 of that particular chapter, when he used to take care of his father's sheep in the wilderness near Bethlehem, a lion or bear would come and uh, take the sheep away. And David says he used to go up behind the lion and the bear, rescue the sheep from the lion's mouth or the bear's mouth. Then the lion of bear would come after David. And David killed the lion of bear with his bare hands. That was actually training. Training for David depend upon the Lord. So going back to that experience of being trained in the wilderness as a shepherd boy, taking his father's sheep, he learned to trust in the Lord. Now when he faced Goliath, who came with a spear and javelin and all the armory, David tells King Saul, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion of the bear will remain from this Philistine. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to challenge armies of the living God? 
He went before Goliath, trusting in the Lord. His confidence was in the Lord, not in his own self. Not self-confidence, but confidence in the Lord. And in fact, confidence in Christ. Because David's Lord was actually Christ. Very often I share this. In Psalm 34, verse 4, and he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me, delivered me from all my fears. That Lord that David called upon was actually the Christ, the coming Christ. Because much later when Christ entered the world and was given the name Jesus or Yeshua, there's a point of time when he asked the Pharisees, 22nd chapter of Matthew from verse 41, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The Pharisees say, the son of David. Then Jesus says, then how is it that David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, calls him Lord? And Jesus quoted Psalm 110 verse 1, where David says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make enemies of put to your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? So David's Lord was Christ. So his confidence was not in himself, but in Christ, the coming Christ. And he experienced the power of Christ in the wilderness when he faced the lion and the bear, rescued the sheep. The lion came after him, he killed the lion and the bear with his bare hands. He was trained in the wilderness. And now comes Goliath. Nothing for David because he trusted in Jesus, the Christ. And he said, I will face him because my Lord delivered him from this Philistine. And when Saul tried to put his armor upon David, because after all, Goliath had a full armor. He had a spear, a javelin, he had a helmet in all the armory of, the, of a soldier. And here this little boy, shepherd boy, just a sling and, uh, you know, uh, and a staff. And then uh, Saul puts his armor upon David. David tries the armor. He said, no, no, I feel uncomfortable. I can't bear this. He didn't even want to uh, bear Saul's armor. He took a rod, his shepherd's staff he took, took his sling and five stones. Only one stone was required. He didn't need five stones. He took five stones from the stream. Only one was required. What we learn from that is, any struggle we face, our confidence must be in the Lord, not in ourselves. So self-confidence is not required for a Christian. When we have confidence in Christ to do whatever he wants us to do. In the book of Isaiah, 28 chapter 16 is written, no one of trust in be put to shame. Confidence in Christ means trusting in him, relying upon him. That's the meaning of confidence. It's all about him. And whatever he's called us to do in life, in our calling, in our life, in a ministry, we can do everything effectively because of the resources God gives us. When you trust in him, have confidence in the Lord. And that's a requirement for every Christian. There's a verse in the Bible, with very well-known verse, Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Look at that particular verse. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Where is the focus on that particular verse? Is it I can or him who gives me strength? I can, yes. How? Because he gives me strength. So our hope is his strength, not I can. Without him, we can do nothing. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. The Apostle Paul, for the life and ministry, entirely depend upon the Lord. Because I put no confidence in the flesh. Not in myself, only in him. He was such an effective minister of God's word. And he gives the secret of his ministry to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians, third chapter. Five and six. Not that we are common ourselves to claim anything from God. Our competence comes from God. 
He has made us competent as Mr. of the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, as we depend upon the Lord, put our trust in him, confidence in him, he empowers us to do what we have to do through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Today, Jesus anoints us with the Spirit. In the second chapter of Acts, when the anointing first came upon God's people, Peter explains to everybody what's happening. The people from all over the empire, Roman Empire had come there, Jews had come from all over the empire, from Arabia, from Italy, different parts of the world, because the Feast of uh, Pentecost was there, 50th day after Passover, Pentecost. They come to celebrate this festival. And when the anointing came upon these people, 120 of them, they began to speak in tongues as Peter enabled them. And these people come out, the different part of the empire, they're shocked, amazed. How come these are Galileans? They speak our language. And Peter explains to all these people what's happening about Jesus. Acts 2.33 Exalted to God's right hand, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out upon us. After being exalted to God's right hand, on the 40th day after he was crucified, 10 days later, the day of Pentecost, he began to pour his spirit. He received, from, he received from the Father the promise for his spirit, whom he has poured out. Who has poured out? Jesus. He's the one who baptized the Holy Spirit today. And by that anointing, all of us can do whatever we were called to do. Even the Old Testament time, when Zerubbabel was commissioned to build the temple in Jerusalem, in Zechariah, Chapter 4, verse 6 is written, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Holy Spirit empowers us, makes us competent. When you put our trust in Jesus, Jesus anoints with the Spirit. For us to do whatever we want to do, whatever we are called to do, rather, whatever we are called to do. By giving us wisdom and giving us power. Wisdom and power are both given to us by the Holy Spirit's anointing. First Corinthians 12, chapter verse 8. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom to know how to respond to situations, how to respond to people, how to respond to difficult circumstances. To know how to respond, God gives wisdom to the Spirit. To be able to respond, he empowers us through the Spirit of God. That's why the entire ministry of the Apostle Paul was by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 15, 18, he writes, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Meaning Gentiles, obey God by what is said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about how he only talk about what the Lord did through him through the power of the Holy Spirit. The entire conference was in the Lord, not in himself. And also his ministry in 1 Corinthians, second chapter, 4 and 5, he writes, My message and my preaching are not wise and persuasive words. But the demonstration of Spirit's power, the faith does not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. That truth is understood, depending totally upon the Lord. There's nothing God will not be able to do through us. It's all about Him working in and through us. When He put our entire confidence in the Lord. For every aspect of Christian life, for our ministries, Confidence in him. For our life, confidence in his resources. For effective prayer. If you look at 1 John chapter 5, 14 15, we read. This is a concept we have in approaching God. This is a confidence we have in approaching God. 
Tivas said, God is will, he hears us. A confident prayer is the will of God. Maybe according to the will of God, we know he is heard. And if we know he is heard, we know what we receive what we ask of him. So confidence in prayer also is when we pray according to the will of God. To know the will of God, we must also know his word. That's why in John 15, 7, Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish to be done. For you. you remain in me, let my words remain in you. And ask whatever you wish. Because then you pray according to the will of God. We have confidence of prayers being heard when we ask according to his will, which means according to his word. Once his word comes to us, we are called to obey his word, live rightly before him. Then what happens? We'll have confidence of his promises being fulfilled in our lives. When you walk rightly with him, we will not doubt the promises. We know, for example, based on scriptures, 2 Corinthians 1.20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. We know that. It's for us. To have confidence that be fulfilled, we must walk in the ways of God. And we put a confidence in him, trust in him, we'll obey him, naturally we'll obey him. We know he knows much more than we know. We won't go by our will, we'll go by his will, because our trust is in him. Trusting that he is God and we are humans, we are weak. He is not weak, he is absolutely strong. He loves to give us strength, loves to give us wisdom. With wisdom and strength from him, trusting in him, we can do everything that he wants us to do. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. For life and godliness by his divine power, which is manifested through his spirit upon us. Now, the thing is, after we start in the spirit, in the beginning Christian life, we are very trusting in God and we pull everything to him and we walk nicely. And after some time, what happens is, it's possible, having begun with the spirit, we've gone with the flesh. It's possible. For example, the Apostle Paul, he rebooked the Galatians. The church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 3, from verse 1 to verse 5. If you look at the passage. Says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched? Bewitched means what? Some spell is been put upon you. You've been uh, controlled by somebody else. Who has bewitched you? Do you see the Holy Spirit and God with miracles among you because you Observe the law because you believe what you heard. Having begun with the spirit, how can you go on in the flesh? Problem in the churches was they began with the spirit and they tried to impose rules and regulations upon people. Keep the law, keep the rules that man has provided for you, given you. They began with the spirit and turned the flesh. Who has bewitched you? How do you say Holy Spirit? By believing what you heard, or by obeying the law? Does God work miracles among you because you obey the law or because you believe what you heard? Obviously because you believe what you heard. You trusted in God. Having begun with the spirit, are you going on in the flesh? How often you find people today, Christians, they begin in the spirit of some time, they put their trust in themselves. Oh, I can do, I can do everything. But, we have to constantly depend upon him. The story in the Bible about a certain king in the Old Testament time, he began very well, godly king. In fact, if you look at the history of Israel, after David and Solomon, there were 40 kings, 20 in Israel, 20 in Judah. Out of 40 kings, only eight of them were godly kings, only eight. And all eight were from Jerusalem. Judah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Amaziah, 
Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, Josiah. Eight kings. The first among them was Asa. The first godly king after the land split in two, Israel and Judah. After Solomon, land split in two. And there were kings in Israel with uh, Samaria as capital, kings in Judah with Jerusalem as capital. The first godly king was Asa. So we look at 2 Chronicles 14 chapter from verse 2 we read, Asa was a godly king. He sought his God and uh, as he began to be rule the kingdom, the first 10 years, nothing happened. Everything was smooth, peaceful, uh, smooth going, everything. The 10th year of his reign, Zerah the Cushite came to attack Jerusalem. 10 years, nothing happened. He was a godly king. He sought God, put away all the Asherah poles, all the high places which put there by the pagans, all removed. He cleansed the land of all the idols. 10 years, everything was fine. Then what happened? Zerah the Kushite came to attack with a very large army, thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Whereas Asa had 300,000 soldiers from, from Judah, 280,000 from Benjamin. 300,000 soldiers from Judah and 280,000 soldiers from Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin. 580,000 soldiers, that's all. Whereas Zerah had thousands upon thousands of Soldiers, so many came, big army. And Asa being a man who depended upon God, confidence in the Lord, cried out in prayer. Lord, there's no one like you to help the weak against the strong. A vast army has come. Lord, we rely upon you, Lord, save us. And miraculously, God intervened and they resisted the enemy and they won the war. God did an amazing miracle for Jerusalem, for Judah, through Asa's prayer and trusting in God, confidence in the Lord. Then what happened? A prophet, Azaria, came and spoke to Asa and encouraged him. You trusted in God, God honored you. If you honor God, he'll honor you. If you don't honor God, he'll not honor you. So God did something wonderful to Asa and the land and God spoke to Asa. Praise God. Wonderful. Then what happened? For the next 25 years, nothing happened. 25 years. 10th year this happened. The 36th year of his reign, 36th year, I mean 25 years after Zerah came to attack, Basha, king of Israel, came to attack Judah. Now 25 years, nothing happened. When nothing happens, people tend to forget about God. And actually, Asa forget about what God did to him earlier, what God spoke to him. Now what happens? Basha comes to attack Jerusalem. And now Asa is applying his intelligence, depending on his own intelligence, not trusting in God. He makes a treaty with the king of Aram, Damascus. Makes a treaty. Break your treaty with Basha. Come and join me. Works for a wonderful scheme to thwart the enemy. In this case, it's going to be Basha King of Israel. Then Hanani, a seer, a prophet, goes and speaks to Asa. We've done a foolish thing. Actually, look at 15th chapter of 2nd Chronicles, verse 17. Asa's heart was come to God all the days of his life. His heart was fully for the Lord all the days of his life. What's the problem then? His mind, heart is committed all the days of his life. Heart is committed. Mind is not depending upon his own intellect. Try to make a treaty with Aram, king of Aram, to thwart Basha's uh, attack on, on Jerusalem. Instead of trusting in God, he's trusting his own intellect. Make a plan to thwart the enemy. And Hanani, the prophet, Rebukh's Asa. Hanani knew that Asa heart was committed, but mind is wavering, trying to be very smart. And then Asa, Hanani tells him, 
Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord raised throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to God. You have done a foolish thing. Your heart is fully committed to God. God knows that. You have a heart fully for God. And he is going to strengthen you. Why are you depending upon your own intellect to try to thwart the enemy? Can't you trust in God? Have you forgotten what God did when Zerah attacked you so many years back? Now why are you trying to use your own intelligence to try to thwart the enemy? You've done a foolish thing. And then Asa gets angry with the prophet. So rectifying his mistake, very angry. He began very well. Trusting in God. God gave him rest, 10 years rest. Then attack came, God intervened. 25 years rest. Then again attack came. This time, he using his intelligence, trying to thwart the enemy. Heart was committed. Mind was not on God. And he tells him, it was a foolish thing. And Asa gets angry with the seer. Then what happens is that in the 39th year of the rain, he has a disease in his feet. Disease in his feet. Even though he had a disease in his feet, he didn't trust God. He depended upon the physicians. He didn't rely on God. His content was in physicians. Went to doctors. Nothing wrong in doctors. But don't depend upon doctors. Always the healer is the Lord, not doctors. Doctors treat, God heals. And the Bible says about this man, Second Chronicles, 16 chapter, verse 12. It talks about how this man, even his sickness, he didn't depend upon God, depend upon the physicians at 39 30, 30 years of the reign. After two years, unfortunately, Asa died of an illness. Began very well, godly king, but then his mind was on his own intelligence, trying to devise his own scheme, not trusting in God. And Hanan said, you are a, your heart is coming to God all your life. God wants to strengthen you. Why can't you depend upon the Lord? What happened, Asa, is a lesson for us. If you look at Romans 15, 4, it says, I think written in the past, what it teach us, so to endurance and the encouragement scriptures we all have hope. Encouragement of the scriptures. The scriptures encourage us to always keep our hearts and minds on the Lord, not just heart. How often you say, oh, I have a heart for God. Always want to obey him. What about your mind? You can have a heart for God, but mind can make earthly plans. Earthly way of doing things. As Hanani told Asa, done a foolish thing. God is searching for people like you. Your heart is committed to God all your life. He's searching for people like you. He wants to strengthen you. Why are you depending upon Basha, king of Israel? Sorry, by, uh, uh, king of Aram, the thought Basha, king of Israel's attack. When hearts and minds are upon the Lord, then we'll always remember what God did to us, what God spoke to us. When David went before Goliath, he remembered how in the wilderness, God trained him to rescue the sheep, number one, and then to kill the lion that came after him. Trained. He never forgot the training. When Goliath came, it was just very simple to deal with the Goliath. He took five stones. One stone was enough. One stone was enough to kill Goliath. He didn't need Saul's armor. He had a staff in his hand. God's order and staff comforted him. He took the staff. He didn't use the staff. Staff was <clears throat> a sign of comfort, security in the Lord because staff represents Holy Spirit's power. A presence, actually. God's <clears throat> being with him. But then his trust was totally in the Lord. So it's possible we begin with the spirit <clears throat> and go on with human endeavor. <clears throat> Think very, very, very wise. So we be always careful about Watching a life and doctrine. So Timothy Paul wrote, First Timothy, fourth chapter sixteen. Watch your life and doctrine closely. In life, we can sometimes, after beginning with the spirit, 
go on in the flesh. At no point of time should we depend upon the flesh. <clears throat> in fact, in the Old Testament time, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, it's written, Cursed be him whose trust is in the flesh, who depend on flesh for strength. Cursed be a man. When it depends on flesh, on human beings, we are cursed. Old Testament, I'm talking about, not New Testament, you're not cursed. Cursed be man who depends on flesh for strength. The heart turns away from God. Heart turns away from God. Whereas, same 70th chapter of Jeremiah, verse 7 and 8, blessed man whose trust is in the Lord. Whose trust is in the Lord. If trust is in man, you are cursed. Trust is in the Lord, you are blessed. He a stream, a tree planted by streams of water. When the drought comes, it doesn't wither away. It leaves the always green. Because you are depending upon the Lord. So it talks about Trusting in man, trusting in God. Jeremiah 17, 5. Curse anyone who trusts in man. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Blessed the man who trusts in the Lord. Now, there is a difference between trusting in man and trusting man. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, verse 7, we read, Love, trust. Love always trusts. We trust people. We don't trust in people. We trust people. Big difference there is. We trust people because we trust in God. Trusting in God means putting entire confidence in Him. And because we put a confidence in Him, we trust people. They let us down. We don't bother about it because God, our trust is in God. Trusting in God means entire confidence in Him. But trusting in man means putting confidence totally in man. Now, just learn from a little child. A little child, may less, less than a year old, a few months old, when this child is in the mother's arms, that child has no cares, no cares in the world. Anywhere the mummy goes and holds the mummy in the arms, mummy is holding the baby in the arms, baby is not all uh, insecure. Baby's trust is I am in the in, in the arms of my mother, nothing will happen to me. Any, anything attack comes, my mommy will take care. My daddy will take care. As long as the parents are around the baby, the baby is not bothered. Anywhere they can take her. In the arms of the baby, the baby is secure. Because baby's confidence is mommy and daddy. As simple as that. Now look at God's uh, blessing through Moses to Benjamin. Among the 12 tribes, Benjamin was the youngest son. Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter, Dinah, born to Leah. And Benjamin is the youngest. With the youngest, he must have been insecure. Insecure because all the elder brothers were there, intimidating him. And the blessing to Benjamin, which Moses gave, tribe of Benjamin, least among the tribes, in the book of Deuteronomy, that is chapter verse 12. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long. And the one in the Lord, uh, on the one who trusts in the Lord, rests between his shoulders. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him. Benjamin, you are beloved of the Lord, rest secure in the Lord. You are secure in his arms. He holds you in his arms. Like a baby in the arms of a mother, Lord holds Benjamin, the least tribe. Today, our security should be in Jesus. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Micah prophesied about how in Bethlehem, the Messiah would be born. The only prophecy about Bethlehem having been where the Messiah would be born. A few verses down, verse 4 and 5, they will live securely and he will be their peace. All the people have put the trust in the Messiah, in, in, in the Christ, they will live securely for he will be their peace. Through him, they have oneness with God. Since God is for them, who can be against them? 
and therefore our security is called to be in the lord security confidence trust depends upon the lord all go together when that is accomplished when that is held on to there's nothing for us to worry romans 8:31 if god be for us who can be against us so after beginning with the spirit don't go on in the flesh Yes, before we believe us in Christ, we are told have confidence in yourself. Believe in yourself. You can do. You can do it. Just do it. Now it's all about Him. Now it's all about He doing through us, not we doing for Him. He working in and through us, because we are the workmanship of God. He works in us. We are the potter. So we are the clay. He is the potter. The potter works in the clay. He never gives up on the clay. He keep on working in us, and that is clear. Then in life we enjoy every moment of our walk with Lord, trusting Him for everything, for our life, for our mysteries, for answers to prayers, conferences, His will. To know that. Every promise is given will be fulfilled in lives. Conference is when we obey Him. If you look at uh, Isaiah, thirty-second chapter of seventeen, it says, "Put the writers, put the writers in peace. Effect the righteousness, quietness, and conference forever. Put the righteousness is peace. Today our righteousness is in Christ, so we have peace. Effect the righteousness." Is quietness and confidence forever. At no point of time should we put confidence in ourselves. Yes, God uses us, but He works in us. It's His power, His wisdom, His power. If we lack wisdom, as the Word of God exhorts us, ask Him; He'll give. James one five. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who gives generously to all the finding for? It will be given, and don't doubt. Strength. Every believer in Christ can experience his strength. That's why the apostle Paul is exhorting the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter six, verse ten. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in His mighty power. His mighty power. Don't put a trust in your own strength. Will fail. Depend upon him for him to strengthen us. He'll keep on strengthening us for us to do his will. The nature of God is: those whom he calls, he justifies. Romans eight thirty: those whom he calls, he justifies. And the calling for all of us is to imitate Jesus, to be godly. In that process, he will give us everything we need for life also. Second Peter one three. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Now, as we go about doing what we have to do, after some time is possible. As I said, begin with the Spirit, accomplish many things by the power of God. After some time, think that I did it. I did it. I made it in life. I got a mystery. Never thinks because of their obedience that God uses. Uses because they are available for people. The Lord warned the Israelites before they entered the land of Canaan. He told them, "You obey me, I'll give you the land." But He also gave a caution to them. When they enter the land of Canaan, when they become prosperous, successful, when they occupy the land, when God Himself clears the land for them, He told them, gave them warning before they crossed over. Book of Deuteronomy, eight chapter, seventeen eighteen. You may say to yourself, "My power and the strength of my hands produce wealth for me," but remember the Lord your God, who gives the ability to produce wealth. You may say, "I've made money. I'm prosperous here. God provided land, cleared the land for me, and here I am. My strength and my power produce wealth for me." God says, "Remember." Lord your God, 
who gives the ability to produce wealth. So for us to be able to work in the ministry also, we need strength, we need health. That's a gift of God. Please don't take health for granted. It's a gift of God. To be able to breathe is a gift of God. So we can never take credit for ourselves. So anybody who really is, is putting his confidence in the Lord, not in himself, he or she will always glorify the name of Jesus, exalt the name of Jesus, and praise the name of Jesus. Glorify, exalt, and praise. Three things. What is the difference between all this? To praise him is to give, speak well of him to people. Always speak well of him. Never talk bad about God. Why God is it? God is unfair. He's being uh, partial. Never say those things. Always speak well of God. To praise him, uh, we are called to praise him to people. That's why in Psalm 9, verse 1, Psalm says, I'll praise you, Lord, at all times. I'll tell of all your wonders. I'll praise you at all times. So praising God is speaking well of God to people. Exalting him is to lift up his name, not your name, lift up his name. God will use us for many things. He'll use us, but don't take credit for that yourself. Exalt his name. John 12, 32, he says, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw people to myself. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw people to myself. So praising him is to speak well of him. Exalting is to lift up his name. Glorifying him is to give him all the credit. Later on in life, when God uses us wonderfully, people come praise us, give him all the credit. It's because of him, I am what I am, like Paul told. First Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. So all of us are called to praise him. Of course, worship him. Worship him, worship him to him. Praising God to God is worship. Praising Him to people. Exalting His name and glorifying Him for every good thing in our lives. For our mysteries, for our success in life, for effectiveness in ministry, for blessings He's given us, for everything, we glorify His name. Give Him all the credit, all the praise, all the honor. And never take credit for ourselves. Because after all, we are the workmanship of God. We are the clay, he's the potter. Clay is only clay. The potter makes the clay beautiful into a nice pot. So we are his workmanship. The workmanship is not as important as the workman who works in us. All glory must go to him and there's something in the heart and the mind, both. You can be very humble in front of people, but in the heart, with, oh, I have done something, I have achieved something. It's all grace, 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 nothing but grace. And this is the mercy of God, 2 Corinthians 4.1, and the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. It's grace and mercy, all because He loves us with an everlasting love. So we can begin very well in the spirit, but go on in the flesh later on. We have to be very careful, depend upon the Holy Spirit of God, to counsel us, to guide us, to empower us, asking for wisdom, asking for strength, and he will enable us to glorify the name of Jesus. Not glorify ourselves, but glorify his name. If Christ is truly Lord of our lives, we will depend totally upon him, put our confidence in him, never any confidence in our own flesh. Not self-confidence, but Christ's confidence. Confidence in Christ. David's confidence was in Christ when he went before Goliath. His Lord was Christ. May God bless us. Like our office goes rise, we pray for you. Thank you, Father, for the privilege, Lord. We can put all our confidence in you, Lord. You will never let us down, Lord. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Teach us, Lord, to always humble us, Lord. To lift up your name. To exalt your name. To glorify your name. To praise your name, Lord. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise and help us, Lord, live every day for you, Lord, and be a blessing to others as you bless us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>